But there are some meaningful differences between the way Christian, uh, between the way slavery is practiced in Christian societies and in Muslim societies. We could also talk about Jewish societies. That was not my main area of research, but I think that could be included pretty easily as well. Um, so there are some differences, but there are also some features that are similar that I felt hadn't received enough attention. So one is just the idea that slavery was legally and socially acceptable, that this was something that people more or less took for granted. They didn't necessarily like it, but they took its existence for granted as a part of human society. And since that's not an assumption that we share, that's something that needs to be stated, I think. And then there's the idea that legally and socially acceptable slavery has a basis in religious difference. So who is allowed to be enslaved is determined based on their religion being different from the people who are enslaving them. So Christians, it's okay for Christians to enslave Jews and Muslims and other pagans, other kinds of people, but not Christians, fellow Christians. It's okay for Muslims to enslave Christians and Jews and pagans and other people, but not fellow Muslims, etc. So there's the idea that it's acceptable. There's the idea that it's the basis of it, the ideological basis is in religious difference. And then the third thing that I thought was really important to point out was the idea that this is a universal threat. So there are some groups enslaving other groups at a higher frequency, but ultimately anyone who is in the wrong place at the wrong time, who gets captured by the wrong ship, who is on the losing end of the wrong war, has the risk of being enslaved. There are some groups that are more vulnerable to it than others, but this is something that we're not used to thinking about when we think about the transatlantic slave trade. Um, for example, the people from the slave trading societies in the Mediterranean are also vulnerable to enslavement, just, not just in theory, but in practice, people do get enslaved. So that was something that I wanted to highlight. That's kind of the first part of the book. So that's talking about practices of slavery. The second part of the book, I was really focusing more on the slave trade and looking at it from an, an economic and a legal perspective. So where do slaves come from? How do people become enslaved? I was focusing on sources of slaves in the Black Sea. So then how are people moved from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean? How do slave markets operate in Eastern Mediterranean cities? And I was focusing in particular on Genoa, Venice, and Cairo, because those are the three biggest slave markets in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and what I was interested in going into the project was the question of who are the slave traders, right? Who are their slave merchants? Are there specialists? Do they have guilds? Do they have companies? How do they operate? And what I ended up finding is that there were very few specialist slave traders. A lot of the people who were trading slaves were also trading many other kinds of things. So slaves were one in a whole set of commodities that they were dealing with and that they weren't very organized. Um, that the way the slave trade was structured had a lot more to do with state policy on slave trading than it had to do with individual or collective action by merchants. So that was not what I was expecting. Um, and that, so I'll talk a little bit about how I got into this, especially since the results turned out not to be what I thought I was going to find when I first got into this project. So I went to graduate school at Columbia, and I, the first semester I was there, I thought I had better take a class with my advisor, who was Adam Costo, and he was that semester co-teaching a class on captivity with uh, Evan Hayfully, who specializes in early American captivity narratives and Native American um, captivity and slavery. So I thought, I, I didn't know anything about captivity or slavery in particular, but I thought I should take that class. And I ended up then searching for a topic. I knew that I wanted to study Christian Muslim interactions in the Mediterranean. So I was looking for how can I talk about slavery or captivity in the Mediterranean? And there was a little bit of literature on captivity, but there was really nothing on slavery. I had never heard anyone talk about slavery in the Middle Ages at all, but because I had to write a paper for this class, I had to go looking for something about slavery in the Middle Ages. And it turned out that that paper was probably the worst paper I've ever written for a class, but it became clear to me that there were a lot of questions, right? That there, there was 
a lot of sort of small studies that were not connecting with each other. And in the period of a semester, I couldn't really do enough with that. I was just getting familiar with the fact that this was even a topic, that people had written anything about it, trying to figure out what the primary sources were. So that paper was not a very satisfactory paper, but it was one that I really wanted to build on because it was clear that there was a lot more there. And the issue that emerged to me right away, I'm gonna show a map also, just so people can see what I'm talking about. Um, the question that emerged right away was um, this question about the slave traders. Who were the slave traders? And when I read sources that, or when I read studies that were based primarily on European sources, not just Italian sources, but French sources and other places as well, they seem to agree that the most important slave traders in the Eastern Mediterranean were Italians and particularly the Genoese. And that those slave traders were responsible for all the Eastern Mediterranean slave trade. So not just the trade back to Italy, but they were also trading slaves from the Black Sea into the Middle East, to the Mamluks in Egypt and sort of the greater Syria area. Then when I went and read things that were read by, written by people who are specialists in Middle Eastern history, who are specializing, specializing in the Ayyubids and the Mamluks, et cetera, they said that the main slave traders were from the Middle East, were from the Mamluk kingdom or from the Ayyubid kingdom. And the way these two things were framed, they could not possibly both be true, right? Either the main group of slave traders is Italians or they're not. And depending on which body of primary sources you look at, apparently you get totally different answers. So that really intrigued me because there was something there. And so I ended up following up on it. I wrote several other papers for other classes. I tried to shoehorn this topic into as many classes as I could so I could continue working on it. And then I turned it into my MA thesis and then I still wasn't satisfied. So I decided I was gonna turn it into a dissertation. So it did kind of start from this one paper and grow into something much bigger because the further I got into it, the, the more questions it raised. But this question about the slave traders was kind of my starting question because it was such an obvious contradiction and I had no idea what to do with it. Um, as I got further into it, and especially I, once I got to sort of the dissertation level of this, um, what I realized was that the slave trade was really messy. It was extremely disorganized. And so there were not specialist slave traders. They were not organized really into companies. They were not cooperating with each other. Um, they were not um, negotiating collectively in any way with each other or with the states that were regulating them. And so the real challenge ended up being how to try to describe a situation that was fundamentally messy and disorganized in a way that would make sense to readers, but without losing the disorganization, right? I didn't wanna impose false order that didn't actually exist. Because one of the things that made this system both really interesting and also very challenging to study, I mean, there was a reason why the, the studies of this had been kind of fragmentary previously, and that's because it's a mess. So I didn't want to lose the mess, but I also wanted to explain it in a way that was coherent. So that ended up being the big challenge. And um, what I ended up doing, this is chapter six in the book, is thinking about it in terms of constraints. So rather than merchants having a system because they did not have a system, there were certain constraints that they had to operate under. And so some of those were geographic, you know, where can you ship things? It turns out when you're shipping things in and out of the Black Sea, there are certain routes that make sense and other routes that do not. So if you're going on these certain routes, um, you have to worry about water supplies, you have to worry about political permission to pass through carrying slaves. Um, you have to worry about taxes. So focusing on those constraints, you can then find patterns. So even though individual merchants are doing things, they're making all different kinds of choices, their choices do fall into a couple different sets of patterns. And so that was a way to not completely remove the mess, but explain it in some kind of way that would make sense. So as I was working on this, um, I've had a couple of other projects that have spun off into other directions. And so that's what I want to talk about um, for the second part of this talk is having this big project that just kept on raising more and more questions the further I got into it. 
Some of those questions I was able to address in the book, but there were other questions that did not fit in the book for various reasons. Some of them because of length, some of them because they really were sort of veering off in different directions. So I had to choose to take some things and just deal with them separately. And so that's, that's what I want to talk about now. And the first of these projects is the most separate, the most different from the book. I ended up writing an article about the Black Death which was not something that I spent any time thinking about in graduate school whatsoever. I was really interested in the slave trade and that was what I wanted to understand. Um, so what ended up being the argument of this article, it's, it's a focus on the early spread of the Black Death. So how did the Black Death move from the Black Sea to Europe in 1347? What happens after 1347 is also quite interesting, but that's not the focus of this article. So what I ended up arguing is that the movement of the Black Death is tied to rodents that are moving with the grain trade, right? The Black Death is a bacterium, Yersinia pestis. It lives mainly in rodents. It can infect humans as well, but normally it lives in rodents. Um, so when people are shipping grain out of the Black Sea, which up until a month or so ago, I wouldn't expect audiences to be familiar with how important the Black Sea is as a source of grain for the entire Mediterranean region. But now given the war in Ukraine, we all know that this is a disaster for areas that import grain. That goes all the way back to the 14th century and earlier, right? This was a grain exporting region, has been a grain exporting region for a long time. So in the more mid 14th century, um, people are exporting grain from this area north of the Black Sea. And that that is the mechanism by which the bacteria move from the Black Sea into Mediterranean communities. So it is not tied to dead bodies being thrown over the wall during the siege, which is the story that we tend to get taught. Um, and proving this in as much detail as I could muster is most of what's in this article. So we already knew biologically, right, that plague, the disease that causes the Black Death plague is caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis. And we know that Yersinia pestis is not transmitted from dead bodies to living bodies. That's not how transmission works. It either is transmitted via rodents and fleas or it can be transmitted mnemonically. So if you have plague and you cough right in the face of someone else, it is possible that they can get plague in that way, but that's transmission among living people. So the story about throwing bodies, dead bodies over the walls and that this is the mechanism for plague transmission really doesn't make any kind of epidemiological or biological sense. Tearing down that story is easy, building up a new story is difficult. So what I wanted to do, I mean, even once it became clear that this dead body transmission thing couldn't be true, that doesn't mean that we have a new historical narrative to replace it. So what I wanted to do was to write up this narrative about the grain trade in order to have a different version of the story based on a different set of sources that is more both historically plausible and biologically plausible. So I got into this backwards. The order that I just told you the story is backwards from the way that I wrote this article. Um, I was not thinking about this at all when I was writing my dissertation and looking at the slave trade, but I was investing a lot of time in understanding shipping routes between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, and I was interested in that for the purposes of understanding the slave trade. But the year right before I graduated, uh, Monica Green, who is the main scholar of plague in the US at this point, I think I can say, um, came and gave a talk and went out for lunch with the graduate students afterwards, as happens. And I told her about what I was working on. And she told me to look for plague. Basically, she told me that the the biological story about how plague works was changing. And I was sort of vaguely aware about this, but she gave me more details about what the latest research was. And she said, there are not a lot of people who pay any attention to communication between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. So if that's something that you're interested in, you should look for just anything that might come up about plague. And if you find something, it's probably publishable. So I had no idea that seemed like good advice. So I shelved it and didn't really think much more about it. And then about three years later, I was doing book revisions. And so I needed to go back and 
review some primary sources and there were some things I hadn't had time for for the dissertation that I wanted to look at before I published the book, which included Venetian diplomatic records from the Black Sea. So I was, there's, there's a published book of these. So I was going through these Venetian diplomatic records just to see, looking at treaties and see, things to see if there was anything I had missed about the slave trade. And I came across this whole series of letters and treaties from the 1340s that were talking in great detail about grain embargoes. And since she had told me to look for this, I knew that there was a connection between grain and plague transmission, and this was exactly the right time. So I thought I should follow up and started looking more into who's shipping grain to where and exactly what is the timing of this in relation to when plague starts moving. And in following up, what I found is that a lot of the standard literature on plague is actually very vague about the dates. So they'll say, there's a plague outbreak in Constantinople. When? Was it in 1345, 1346, 1347? It turns out that's extremely difficult to pin down. And just moving all along the line, attaching specific dates to things in order to compare them with the dates of these grain embargoes took a lot more work than I thought. Um, and in the process of trying to track down exactly what was happening when in relation to grain embargo and plague outbreaks, I found this petition from the people in Kaffa, I'll show you the map again, so you can see Kaffa um, on the Crimean Peninsula, who, this is the city that was supposedly besieged by the Mongols and the dead bodies were thrown over the walls during the siege and that's how the people in Kaffa got sick and then they went back to Genoa. So there was a petition from the people in Kaffa after the siege was over writing back to their sort of metropole in Genoa to ask for funds and ask to send a new bishop and things like that. And in this petition, they say, the Golden Horde is experiencing a disease. We have not experienced it yet, but we expect that it will come soon. And once we are affected by this, they'll attack us again, right? So it was super clear that disease transmission happened after the siege and not during the siege. But that was the last piece of evidence I found in this research process. It was not the first piece of evidence. So when I first sat down to try to write this up into an article, I wrote it up in the order that I found the information, right? I started talking first about grain embargoes, and then I started about talking about this petition, and then I talked about the spread into the Mediterranean, which is a classic mistake, right? When I'm grading students' papers, I always tell them, you have to put your main argument at the front, and indeed, that's what you should do. You should put your main argument in, in the first paragraph, and I didn't do that. So when I first submitted this article, it was rejected. And that was very upsetting because I knew it was important research, but you know, I took a day or two and then I went back and read the comments and I realized the readers gave me very good comments and what they thought I was arguing was not what I thought I was arguing. So they were right to reject it. And what I needed to do was rewrite the article to make, to argue what I was actually arguing, right? And to put it up front. So I did, I did a big rewrite. Um, and, and really emphasize these source issues that there's just basic information that we didn't know about the spread of the plague, about you know who's writing the sources, where are the plague outbreaks happening, when. We didn't have a lot of that information. So filling in a lot of those gaps and then explaining how this shows that this is a grain trade issue and this is not a dead bodies over the walls issue. Um, that once I was able to put it together in the proper order and sort of phrase the argument in the proper way, then it got accepted and then I was able to publish it. The other thing that was interesting about this one is this is the only piece of research I've ever done that was all with published sources. Usually what I've worked on has involved archival research at some stage or another. I did no archival research for this, for this article and that actually kind of surprised me. I was assuming that at some point I would have to go either to Venice or Genoa and get into unpublished material, but everything I needed was published. It just hadn't been published in the same place. It was a little bit over here and a little bit over there and a little bit. and because I was asking these questions about exactly what happened, where and when, I was putting it together in a different kind of way. So that was interesting. So in some ways, that's sort of the least connected to the book project. The connection is really just a matter of, of shipping and what are the consequences of these shipping connections between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. Not just slave trade, it turns out. Another thing, and this is a project that emerged more directly out of the book, um, 
I, there are a pair. So one article is already out. That's the first one. That's the, the article that focuses on Cairo. The second article, the, se the second one is a book chapter and that's not out yet. Although hopefully it'll, it'll come out soon. But these are a pair that deal with the inspection process for determining whether an enslaved person is healthy or not before they're sold because there are certain kinds of health conditions, it could be illnesses, could be injuries, et cetera, um, that would invalidate a sale. So this is like very much a legal history topic and also it's about the slave market and about how slave markets function during this period of time. And this emerged because when I was working on the book project, I was looking into how slave markets work. And it was very striking that when I was looking at the Islamic world, so the Mamluks, Cairo, Alexandria, Damascus, there's a whole genre of slave buying advice. So if the inexpert buyer goes to the slave market and wants to buy an enslaved person, what do they need to know in order to make sure that they're buying someone who is going to be healthy and who is going to be suitable for whatever purpose they have in mind for slave labor, right? And there's nothing like that for Genoa or Venice or for anywhere in Italy. And this was really striking to me because in other respects, the markets operate very similarly. So you would expect the same problems to come up about um, assessing slaves and deciding whether you wanna buy one or not, a particular one. And also because these are both drawing on the same medical tradition, right? Um, people in the Middle East and people in Italy are both drawing on the Hippocratic and Galenic traditions. And then you have these Abbasid era commentators who are being translated into Latin. So their medical authorities are generally the same people and the same texts. And yet you have this sort of medicalized genre of slave buying advice in one case and not in the other. So I thought that was very interesting. And that was something I wanted to know more about. So I started, I decided to focus on the Mamluk case first, just to try to understand the genre better. And there are three examples that I was focusing on. Two of them are from the Mamluk period. One of them is from the Ayyubid period, but it's right before the transition to the Mamluks. So I thought those three kind of went together. Two of them have been, so one of them has been published. There's a 15th century one that's been published. There's a 13th century one, that's the Ayyubid one that has not been published, that's very interesting, but also very long and elaborate. And then there's a 14th century one that's a fragment. So I thought I'll focus on the fragment because that's something I could actually publish in edition and translation and do it at an article length rather than doing it at a book length. So this is an advice genre that's written by physicians. Um, but it's not just about health. It turns out that it is also about control and coercion in the slave market. So the inspection is partly about determining the state of health of the person who's being sold, but it's also about humiliating them and humiliating them publicly by doing this very intrusive medical inspection in a public place. And this is about reinforcing their disempowered status as slaves. So Working on that article and that text helped me get a better sense of what is the function of this genre, right? It's not just about the market. It's also about exercising control over slaves and teaching people techniques for exercising control over slaves. Then I wanted to know how this works in Italy. So this was the part that there wasn't really space for in the book, right? I needed to keep the book at a reasonable length and I didn't wanna go off on this long discourse about the slave market. So I ended up bringing some of this material into the book, but spinning it off as a, an article enabled me to go into a lot more depth, but not have that all have to be contained in the book. I could write this article and then I can footnote it in the book and people who wanna know more can go get all the details. But I wanted to do the comparison with Genoa as well. So this is the second, the book chapter. And once I felt like I had a good handle on the function of the genre in the Islamic world, then I could go see if they don't have this genre on the Italian side, how do they deal with this set of problems? Both the set of problems of how do you determine an enslaved person's health so that you can make sure the contract is valid. And then also how do you exert control over slaves? How, how do people learn how to do that? So, what I found was that this difference in the genres emerges from a difference in the legal structure. So in Mamluk contracts for slave sale, the, um, the, the legal response, the liability for any kind of dispute that might happen after the sale is finished is on the buyer. 
So if you buy a slave and then you find out that they're pregnant or they have leprosy or something else that might invalidate the contract, it's the buyer's responsibility to have determined that. And if they fail to determine that, then it's their fault, right? They're liable. So that's why there's this advice genre that's dedicated to buyers. On the Italian side, the way Italian warranty structures work in slave sale contracts, the, the liability is placed on the seller. So if someone sells a slave who's pregnant or has leprosy or whatever and doesn't disclose that information, it's not the buyer's responsibility, it's the seller's responsibility. So there's not the need to give buyers advice because buyers don't have to worry about liability for this. The, the worry is on the seller's side. And so the written record that this creates is lawsuits. So there's not a genre of lawsuits on the Mamluk side because it's a buyer liability situation. On the Genoese side, there's no advice for buyers, but there's all these lawsuits where buyers later sue the sellers for having sold a slave without disclosing some kind of health condition. So that was a case where in a certain sense, this is comparing apples and oranges, right? These are two totally different genres, but they're two totally different genres that are addressing the same situation and comparing them raised questions that people who just specialize in Italy or just specialize in the Mamluks wouldn't necessarily think to raise because they haven't thought about what the alternative ways of dealing with the situation would be. So this was really interesting for me to try to get outside of my sort of get across the discourses in different fields. Um, it turns out physicians are also important in the Genoese case, but in, they're not writing advice. They're being called in as expert witnesses. So once one of these legal disputes comes up, then they need to interview the slave and inspect the slave. And then they will interview other people as well, people in the household, and give their opinion both about what, you know, is this person sick? If so, or are they experiencing some other kind of condition? If so, what is it? And they need to talk about how it developed over time. Do they think this was present at the time of sale or do they think it's something more recent? So it's a whole different set of genres with a whole different set of considerations, but it's addressing the same set of problems, which was interesting. So this was kind of something that I would have liked to include in the book, but there wasn't enough space. And so spinning it off was a way to be able to get into it in much more detail. Um, the other thing that came out of looking at the lawsuits this genre of slave buying advice is about the slave owners, right? The lawsuits involve interviewing slaves. And so this actually turned out to be a really interesting way to access, it's not directly the voices of slaves because their testimony is being recorded by notaries. So there is sort of an intervening person who is the person who's actually writing it down with the pen. Um, in some places they're translating, right? If it's, a, if it's a Latin document, they're translating probably into Latin. If it's a dialect document, then perhaps they're not, but that's an interesting question as well. Um, so there are additional methodological issues, but this is a case where slaves are actually being interviewed about their health and their answers are being recorded in great detail. And so this is leading me now into a whole new set of directions. Now that I've been focusing on these lawsuits, I have a bunch of other questions about how slaves' testimony is recorded by notaries. And so that's a new direction that I'm interested in now. The last project I'll talk about quickly, and then we can start the Q&A. This is um, an article that came out last year. So this is my most recent thing that's come out. This is um, an article about insurance. So insurance in the way that we know it today first emerged in 14th century Italy. There are some earlier forms of things that are so, perform similar functions to insurance, but they're not insurance contracts in the way that we're used to thinking about them. And Genoa was, if not the first, then certainly very early to come up with insurance. There's some debate about this among scholars of insurance, whether it's Venice or Barcelona or whatever. Anyway, Genoa is definitely one of the very early adopters, if, if it's not the first. Um, the first forms of insurance that were developed were shipping insurance. So if you have commodities on ships and the ship sinks, then there's insurance for, for those goods. Very quickly after shipping insurance, the next form of insurance that emerges is life insurance, but this life insurance is only for pregnant enslaved women. Free people's lives are not insured, male or female. This is only for enslaved people, only for women who are pregnant. 
So this was really interesting to me. Um, part of this is because enslaved women were valuable commodities. So the jump from shipping insurance to life insurance for slaves, slaves are among the commodities being shipped, right? So it's not too surprising that that connection is made. Um, and the risk of maternal, uh, maternal mortality is very high during this period. So this is a risk comparable to the risk of losing your ship in, in a storm, right? So again, in terms of both the risk calculations and the commodification of people, it makes sense that this is the direction that insurance moves. The other thing though, is that in the late 14th century when this form of life insurance appears, this is a period in Genoa specifically where the children of a free man and an enslaved woman were more likely to be freed, legitimated, and adopted as heirs. So this is a period when free men are paying special attention to the pregnancies of their enslaved women um, because the children that are going to be born are potentially their future heirs. I wanted to talk about that because this is an area that pops up as kind of a footnote in articles on the history of insurance. And it also pops up as a footnote in the history of slavery, but I thought it deserved its own study because this, this connection between the maternal mortality and slavery and the status of children and the emergence of life insurance is just really fascinating. It's also a really fascinating comparison with life insurance um, in the context of the US, right? So when life insurance first emerges in an American context, this is early to mid 19th century. Only free men really are enslaved. Women are not free or enslaved. Their lives are not insured because maternal mortality is considered to be too risky and unpredictable. Insurance companies just won't cover women because they don't want to have to deal with that issue. There are some enslaved men whose lives can be insured, people who are doing very risky work. So people who are working in mines, people who are working on steamships. Those slaves' lives are occasionally insured, but it's only men, it's not women. So this is a reverse of the situation of insurance in the US. And so that was another reason I thought it was worth writing about. Um, it might be something that the study of medieval slavery might ha have to actually offer to the study of modern slavery. The thing that was interesting about the process of working on this is this was a pandemic project. Um, I was on leave during 2020, 2021, so I actually had time to do research, but I couldn't go to the archive, so I couldn't really work on my second book project at all, because that really needed archival material, and I was very early, so there wasn't a lot I could do until I went and looked at the archive first. Um, I also didn't have a lot of attention span during 2020 and 2021. This is really exhausting, distracting period. So I picked this project. I thought it was interesting and I thought it was relevant. For me, this was also sort of low hanging fruit because I had found these life insurance contracts when I was first doing my dissertation research. Um, and this was actually the first page of my dissertation that I wrote. I wrote a page about life insurance for enslaved pregnant women but I had no idea what to do with it. Like I couldn't, I thought it was odd and I thought it was interesting, but I didn't really have any context. I didn't know how to expand on it. I didn't know how to connect it to anything else. I didn't know how to justify that it was important. I thought that it was important, but I wasn't entirely sure why. So I had this page that I just sort of had in a file and I ended up, I think with one sentence in my dissertation where I mentioned there was life insurance for enslaved women. Um, so I was doing exactly what everyone else has done, which is to turn this into one sentence or a footnote and say, oh, isn't this odd, you know, and then move on to other things. But I wasn't really satisfied with that. And then I had the situation where I had a lot of writing time and a lot more context having finished this book and nothing else to do and photos of all the documents. So this was something where I had all the materials actually ready to go and it was a fairly contained discrete project with a, a specific set of sources that I already had access to. I didn't need to travel anywhere. I already knew that they were important. And now, you know, 10 years later, I was in a much better position to explain why this was something that anyone should care about. So that's where I wanna stop. Um, and I, let's open it up for questions. And thank you all for listening. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Hannah. Yeah.
um, a lot of different directions in which we can take this. So um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to let me know and um, I will call on you. So there is James first. So I will um, turn it over to him. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot here I'd love to ask you about, but I guess one thing from the beginning and one thing from the end. <laughs> um, so, so you alluded to the disorganization of the slave trade in general um, and the fact that there weren't specialists. And I was especially though intrigued by the fact that there didn't appear to be a lot of cooperation or system establishing. And, and I'm, I'm, could you say just a little bit about, do you have theories about why that is? Um, because I'd love to know if, the, if, if, I'm sure you've considered explanations and I'd love to know uh, why you think that is. Um, the, and, and how it compares to other forms of commerce these guys are doing. Because as you mentioned, it's one of many things they're usually doing. And I assume they're not similarly disorganized about other things. Um, so I'm curious about that. And then I, you, you alluded to another book and I really wanna know what that might be about. That's the thing from the end. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so the slave, I was shocked by how disorganized this was. I was satisfied because I found a comment in the Venetian Senate archives where they also complain about how disorganized it is and how, how frustrating it is to try to regulate it because people are just breaking all the rules and doing all kinds of unpredictable things. So that made me feel better because it wasn't just me. The Venetian Senate was also deeply frustrated by this. Um, but I think, so it looks a little bit different from the Italian side and from the Mamluk side. On the Italian side, um, what I ended up finding was that a lot of the slaves are not being imported for sale. People are importing slaves for themselves. So they, they go to Caffa or Tana or whatever, one of these big ports on the Black Sea, and they buy silk, and they buy dried fish, and they buy honey, and they buy like five slaves. And one of the slaves they're gonna bring home and that person is gonna be a slave in their own household. One of the slaves they buy for their mom. One of the slaves they buy for their business partner. Um, and this, there's this whole set of uh, letters from the Dettini archive in Prato where Dettini is writing to his people in Venice and saying, get me, get me a household slave, right? So this is not, I mean, there will be money exchanged but this is kind of a prearranged sale. Um, and then maybe two of them will be sold on the open market. So only a, suit, a certain number of the people who are being transported are going to be sold in a market context. So that's one reason for this. And then they're buying and selling them alongside other things. The other thing is that, so the slave trade is very intellectually interesting because we're talking about human beings as commodities and that's horrifying and fascinating in all kinds of ways. It's not the most lucrative trade out of the Black Sea and it's also not, we're talking about hundreds or maybe thousands of people per year, thousands if we include the Mamluks as well. When we're talking about the transatlantic slave trade, that is tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people per year. So this is a much smaller scale. Um, and that's the other reason why it's disorganized is that it's, it's, it's kind of a side business for everyone who's involved in it. And their main business is going to be grain export, silk, um, these other commodities that are more the main commodities. And this is this is kind of side dealing and half of it is not even business at all. It's buying people for themselves, for their own purposes. When you look at the Mamluk side, some of it is being conducted in the same way. There are some people who deal in luxuries for the court. And so that can include slaves, um, really elite military slaves. Slave singers are another sort of elite um, commodity. Women who have been trained to compose you know, classical poetry in Arabic and to perform it. Um, they, that, that's sort of a, a, a luxury. So there are people, traders who specialize in those kinds of slaves, but then also jewels, um, other like art, right? I mean, other things that are that, that only get sold to sultans and the other like very high class households. So they do specialize in, in slaves as well, but again, they're not dealing in large numbers. So when you see discussions of that, this is, you know, the, the trader in elite slaves shows up at the sultan's house and he has maybe 10 
slaves who he will display to the sultan and the sultan can choose which one he wants. And then if he doesn't want them all, then maybe he'll take the, the remainder and take them to someone else's, you know, an emir's household and display them there along with jewels and other kinds of things. So in that case, there's a little bit more structure to that trade, but still it's kind of one piece of, of a much bigger business. Um, so that's why there's not a lot of, a lot of collaboration in this is because it is kind of, it's a, it's for everyone involved, it's a piece of something bigger that they're doing. Um, the second, so the, the second, the second book I'm still sort of hesitating about because I still haven't been to the archive. I'm hoping that I can go this summer. My plan is to go this summer. So, you know, six months from now, I might have better answers. Um, there are, so I'm interested in this question about how notaries are representing slaves when slaves are giving testimony. And another context in which that happens are petitions for freedom. So there are people who, so this is, slavery is a, a legal status. There are people who say, I have been illegally enslaved. And so they go to a judge and petition to be free. And so the petition is in their voice. Again, they're not writing it, but they're the one who, who are presenting a petition. And then what kinds of evidence are being used to support or challenge these positions? Not all of the petitions have recorded decisions, but for the ones that do, to what extent do they talk about their reasoning? Um, that's something that I'm really interested in. And I have a couple of examples of those from previous research that I've been looking at that are very interesting, but I know there are more and I need to go look at them. And until I've looked at them, it's hard to tell what's gonna be the best analytical angle for this, so. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Robinson is next. Yeah, th thank you so much for a uh, great presentation. Um, yeah, uh, I think that uh, it's really important to view the transatlantic slave trade in its period because its beginnings were identical to what you described. Um, its beginnings were this piecemeal, slaves are luxury items, slaves are included with other merchandise. And it's not really until you have, uh, you know, this massive necessity for labor uh, and a commodity that's worth um, and so um, you use the word commodity to um, to describe slaves, and I think that's that's absolutely essential. Um, but I guess uh, I have I have a question here um, for you. There's this sort of question um, that arises: at, at what point does does the, the issue of dehumanization really cease its usefulness as an analytical category, mm -hmm. uh, and at what point does commodification? Um, better serve as as an analytical framework, right? Because dehumanization, oh, one has to go through the process. Well, they're just like me; they must be dehumanized before they're enslaved. Whereas of commodification, it's like no, this is a commodity. And so, um, inter uh, I'm really interested in 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 your sort of observations or or ideas about this this particular debate. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think what you said about the transatlantic slave trade is absolutely true. And it's not a coincidence that the first people who are the Portuguese are hiring to do this are Genoese of the nations, right? I mean, that, that there's a reason why that's the case. Um, I have not looked into the comparison that much between the Black Sea and West Africa, but I think that people should. And I, my hope, I think there needs to be better discussion about how the transatlantic slave trade emerges in this longer Mediterranean history. That's not something that's my project, but I think if you wanna do a project about change over time, right, to build that bridge, you need to have a before and an after. And the after, we know a lot about what happens in the Caribbean and the Americas and Brazil and whatever. The missing pier of the bridge is the medieval side, right? And so I'm hoping that by having sort of a better, more thorough, more comprehensible, more coherent study about what's going on in the Mediterranean. And there are other people working on this as well, right? This is now sort of a, a flourishing field, which is pretty exciting. People who are working on slavery in Iberia and in the Aegean Islands and all this kind of thing. Um, I'm hoping that that will make the, what changed in the 15th and 16th and then into the early 17th century, that set of questions is gonna be easier to ask going forward. But this is the kind of thing where you need lots of people involved. You need different scholars who are looking at different sources and then putting it all together. So I'm hoping that this is sort of a, converse, a, a, a contribution towards something that is gonna be a much bigger conversation than what I individually could ever do 
Um, but this question about dehumanization and commodification, this is a great question. And I, at least for my sources, for my period, for what I'm looking at, I don't think dehumanization is a very helpful way to look at this at all. I think for my, the people that I'm looking at who are slave buyers and slave owners, what makes slaves valuable is the fact that they're human, right? It's the fact that they have will. It's the fact that they can make decisions. Um, it's the fact that they can, they can carry out those decisions, especially when you're talking about these enslaved women, it's the fact that they can have children and those children, they can then raise those children and those children can become heirs, right? And that's true on the, the Genoese and Venetian side and on the Mamluk side. So I don't see dehumanization as a helpful way to look at it because I think the humanity of the enslaved people is why people want to buy them. So I think commodification is much more helpful, sort of how do you take people's humanity and put a price on it, right? Um, and dehumanization in, in certain ways is a way to kind of wiggle around the fact that, that humanity is actually what's being bought and sold. And for me, the area where that's really clear is this question about religion and about the souls of slaves and the fact that this is something that people really care about and forcing their slaves to convert to the religion of the slave owners, that's something that they really prioritize. Um, they are not treating slaves like animals. The fact that slaves are not animals is what makes them worth buying. Um, so I could go on more about that, but that's, that's sort of the direct answer to your question. Thank you so much, Hannah, and thank you, Robinson, for that question. And we have Chuck up next. Right. Thanks, Paul. And uh, thanks, Hannah, for a really, really wonderful presentation, um, even though it's not on 18th century British newspapers, right? So, uh, right. As, uh, um, all right. So now, um, I guess I kind of wanted to follow on Robinson's question a little bit, too, because really, um, you know, kind of fascinated um, with what you're finding. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, right, one of that transformations, right, from the messiness, right, to a more systematic um, sort of implementation right, that we see in the Atlantic, you know, has a lot to do with our capitalism also too, right? This great demand for labor. And I'm just wondering at what point, even though if the Mediterranean didn't look like that entirely at, you know, overall as a system, were there points, right? Because we, I mean, sugar was cultivated on Mediterranean islands first, right? Were there ever moments within the system that you found where there was this excessive demand for enslaved people, where it might be tied into sort of you know, these kind of like more broader, you know, market forces or, or, you know, just sort of larger scale productions that may have started to change, however briefly, the system. And then the other question too would be sort of the question of galley slaves, right? I mean, that's sort of the one sort of, you know, obvious place where there is sort of an insatiable demand that could lead to these sort of distortions um, right. and, um, or, and, and, and a change into something that's more systematized. And I'm wondering how sort of that galley slave system, if that sort of factors into what you're looking at. And I guess the final thing too, is just um, more off of the cuff, um, you know, because you had said these like medical, um, the, the sort of like how to treat your slave um, works, you know, we're about sort of ritual humiliations, right? And things like that. So I was wondering, is there like a continuum between like humiliation and dehumanization, right? as opposed to a commodity, right? Because you don't have to humiliate a commodity. A commodity comes to you like just, you know, pre-interchangeable, right? But it sort of felt like that there was kind of a little bit of dehumanization going on with, with rituals of humiliation. So could you just sort of elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so this question about large scale demand, um, generally speaking, no most of the slaves are being used for domestic work. And so you have households, uh, a, ho a slave owning household usually has one, maybe two slaves. Um, the exceptions to that are the Sultan's court because he has military slaves. So there's a big demand for, the, the big demand for, for slaves from the Mamluks is, is as military slaves. So that's sort of an exception there. And there are sort of the demand for military slaves grows and, and, and shrinks depending on what's going on militarily and politically. Um, 
but still we're talking about thousands of slaves per year and not more than that. Um, the areas of sugar cultivation, this is really Mallorca. And what's going on in Mallorca is a little bit different. They are not importing slaves for the purpose of sugar cultivation from the Eastern Mediterranean. They're getting them from wars within the Iberian Peninsula and then from raiding, raiding between the Iberian Peninsula and North Africa. So I don't want to say too much about this because this is sort of the other end of the Mediterranean and not where I'm the most familiar with um, the sources. But a lot of the people they're using for agricultural labor in Mallorca who are enslaved are local people, right? This is after the Christian conquest of Mallorca, what happens to the people who have lost the war? They get enslaved and then they're, they're working on plantations. So you don't necessarily need to import a lot of people. The people are already there. These are the defeated people, right? And so the comparison I think into the new world would be about the enslavement of Native Americans. And at what point is there a shift from enslaving Native Americans to importing people from elsewhere for mass labor purposes? Um, like I said, I don't wanna push this too far because this is going further out of the area that where I'm the most familiar with exactly what's going on. Um, galley slaves also are just later. I mean, during the period that I'm looking at, galleys are rowed by free people. Galley slavery really starts in the 16th century. And I disclaim any responsibility for anything after 1500. Um, so gal galley slaves, I mean, that does turn out to be a mass demand for labor, but that there's, there's kind of a shift in shipping and maritime military structure that happens in the 16th century. And it's just, it's a different world at that point. Um, and then you get the Ottomans and all that kind of thing. I mean, there, there are big shifts that happen in the late 15th and the early 16th century. Um, this question about, right, so humili hum uh, humiliation and commodification. So what I'm looking at are inspections in the market, in the context of sale, um, not anything that happens afterwards. So this, so on the one hand, slaves are unique commodities because they're human commodities. You don't humiliate a piece of cloth. You don't humiliate a horse like that you th that those things don't make sense right slaves are the only kind of commodity that it would make sense to humiliate um and it is that act is dehumanizing right the kinds of inspections that they're doing um they're doing it because in the market context and in this inspection context there are ways in which slaves can intervene right? They're being asked questions, they're being asked to do things, they're being asked to show things. And because they are human, and they do have will, and they do have the ability to make decisions and act on them. Um, and they have preferences and all kinds of things. They do have a little bit of room for maneuver. I don't want to overstate this because this is extremely dangerous for the slaves. Right. So there are very harsh limits on this. But even within those limits, there is this little bit of room. And there's a really good book about this in the New Orleans slave market um, called Soul by Soul that talks about slaves in the slave market and what the slave market looks like from an enslaved person's perspective. So I was looking at that and then going and looking at these medieval slave buying manuals and trying to see where is that room for maneuver in what context, like how are slaves able to make use of that? And then how this humiliation process is a way to try to stop them from making use of that. So it is dehumanizing them because, but it's dehumanizing them because they're human and their humanity needs to be stopped, right? Um, I mean, I talk more about this in the article. So I get more into it in a little bit more detail in the article, but does that make sense? Um. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Um, uh, so, and uh, no, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. I'll maybe just um, one little thing too. It's uh, um, the Eastern Mediterranean references. I was just thinking, I mean, it's ancient, I guess, at this point, but Philip mm -hmm. Curtin's plantation complex mm -hmm. uh, talks a lot about like, you know, the first sugar plantations were in, in on Crete, right? And kind of, he has this metaphor of hopscotching across the Eastern Mediterranean islands and working their way like towards Menorca. Right like in the 12th and 13th century. So I didn't know if that like- um, Yeah. It, 
And it just sort of tied into that thing that you said for the for the grad students in the room or everybody really, um, this idea, you, you said that sort of like little throwaway one page, oh, isn't this interesting and not investigated in people's books. That's such right. a great like pro tip to give to grad students because I've been able to find so much in my own field just by following up on these things that people had mentioned and seeing that there's nothing that's been written on it, but they point you towards the sources that get you started. So, so yeah. just putting that out there. No, absolutely. And I think it is this sort of, when you have that serendipity of noticing something and thinking, I wonder more about this. And then you go look into it and you find out that there isn't anything. That's the gold mine, right? That's figuring out, I mean, it can be a challenge, but figuring out how to follow up on that. Um, yeah, this, so there is sugar cultivation in Crete. I think there's two things so first of all, again, a lot of the slaves in Crete are local people. They're, once Venice takes over Crete, the people who are working on these sugar plantations, there's also different kinds of unfreedom, right? So there are people who are working on sugar plantations who are not free, but I also wouldn't call them slaves. Um, they are called villains. You could call them more like serfs. Um, they have a different kind of unfree status. I also am just a little uncomfortable with tying slavery so closely to sugar production because that's really taking the Caribbean situation and reading it back into the Middle Ages. And yes, there are some situations where slaves are used for sugar production, but slaves are used for so many other things. And if you only focus on slavery and sugar production, I think you miss the bigger picture of what medieval slavery is. So that, that Philip Curtin book has been really influential. I think it could, and I mean, in its time, that was important right, to try to see how this has a much longer history. I think that's something that could use reevaluation, sort of what, what the connection is between Mediterranean slavery and, and Atlantic slavery. And I think we have to look, be, like sugar is a piece of it, but it's only one piece. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you, Hannah. Um, so we can go now to Matt and then Bailey. Wait, I can't hear you. Matt, yeah, we can't hear you. All right, how's that? Is that better? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, switching settings and things. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Barker. I really appreciated this. Um, based on a couple of the comments you just made, I wanted to ask if you could go into a little bit more detail about um, the points you were making about this idea of the humiliation um, manuals, like the the sort of like how to buy a guy like how to buy a slave guides and all of those things versus the the aspect you just mentioned with like this this like quantum of agency that potentially skilled enslaved peoples have and sort of figuring out what the valuation of that those statuses of skilled labor were semicolon for the question and how you're able to figure out what those differentiations of labor are so like if if it's a you know like a, a a trained musical slave right like okay so that's kind of a genre in and of itself but if you have a domestic slave that's uh i'm really interested in cooking and and like domestic kitchen labor how does one become a highly valued kitchen slave that therefore reclaims agency in that way and how does that kind of mesh with the the, the portion you're talking about with like how is that being represented as something that a potential slave buyer needs to reckon with? Right. So, okay, so the room for maneuver is less about skills. Um, and it's more about, um, so the, the seller, for example, might be making claims like this slave is healthy. Can the slave say, no, I'm not, <laughs> you know? I mean, that I'm sort of exaggerating there, right? Um, or there might be someone who, I'm trying to think of a good example right now. Um, there are things like testing slaves to, for their eyesight to see um, whether they can see clearly, whether, I mean, whether they're blind effectively, um, where the kinds of tests that they're doing, it's sort of like, how many fingers am I holding up type of thing. Slaves can choose to cooperate with that or not cooperate in various kinds of ways, which will have an effect on the buyer. So for example, if there's three or four buyers in the market who are bidding on a slave, this is not really an auction, but they're like all inspecting the same slave at the same time. 
and this enslaved person has a an opinion about who they would like to be sold to among the people who are there, can they do something that will attract the attention of one buyer and maybe dissuade another buyer? It's that kind of a situation, right? So like I said, I, the example I gave is kind of ridiculous. This is very subtle, the way that this works. And the humiliation is to try to distract people and remind them of their own disempowerment so much that they don't use those kinds of subtle cues that they could, you know? Um, so this is, so like I said, this is, this is subtle. This is not something that's usually happening in a really obvious way, because if it is really obvious, um, the slave is going to be punished. So they're trying to find a way to ha have these cues or to sort of tip things in one way or another, but not so explicitly that they get in trouble for it. And that is a really delicate balance, as you can imagine, and extremely dangerous the ways that it could go wrong. Um, for figuring out the specialization of slaves, this is where, I mean, the, the sources from the perspective of the slave owners, they talk about this quite directly, right? Um, that tends to show up less in the contracts because it's not a legal aspect of the validity of the sale right? It tends to show up more in the context of letters and chronicles and things like that. Um, so let's see, this is less of an issue on the Italian side because almost all of the slaves are doing domestic work. And so that's not considered by people at the time to be skilled labor with the possible exception of cooking. There are people who are, have a better reputation as cooks than others, right? And um, there's been debate about whether sexual slavery should be considered a specialization or whether it's something that everyone is vulnerable to. And I'm coming down more on the side of this is something that everyone is vulnerable to. Um, but you could count beauty as a specialization as well, right? And then all, like, how do you decide who's beautiful? Um, on the Mamluk side, because you have these, these court slaves, you, which is a much bigger slave population within a single household, there is more specialization. So you have people who are slave singers, slave dancers, slave musicians, these military slaves, they are specialized, right? They don't do other things, they just fight. Um, and there are slaves who, who have knowledge in other areas as well. There's just a much broader range when you're looking at the Mamluk context, but it's because you have these relatively few elite households, but do have really big enslaved populations. Um, you have to include eunuchs as well. I mean, there, then you have slaves who are in these sort of facilitator. The eunuchs tend to be in these kind of facilitating and gatekeeping kind of roles, and that is a specialization as well. Um, so how you decide what slaves are qualified for what things, in some cases they have training. So the slave singers are coming out of a, a, a school. And if they're coming out of the school, they have the credentials associated with that school. The same thing is true for the military slaves. What I'm showing you here, this picture is a, a training manual for military slaves. So if they've been trained in a particular way, then you, the slave seller, can claim that they have this specialization because they've done the training. Um, for cooks or something like that, they, it would be more likely a demonstration. You know, cook something for me and then I'll decide whether I like it and then I'll decide whether I wanna buy the slave. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Hannah. And we'll turn to Bailey now. Hi, Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so you talked about um, slave owners attempting to sometimes return um, slaves that they bought because they found them in some way dysfunctional. I was wondering if you knew like maybe a, a ballpark number of how many were successful at that and how many tried to say return slaves based on their own misconceptions of like the body or uh, what was happening and were you know kind of just misinformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so we have better documentation for this on the Italian side because that's where you get lawsuits, right? Like I explained because of the way the warranties work, we don't have lawsuits for that from the Mamluk side. On the Italian side, 
the, the added wrinkle to this, which makes everything much more difficult, is that there's a standard one month, what's called the period of refusal. So this is where the liability really falls on the seller. So if, if a person sells a slave and within one month after the sale, the buyer decides, actually, I don't want this slave, they can return for, for a health reason. They can return that slave and get the money back and no questions asked. There's no lawsuit. So there's no record of those, which is a pain if that's what you want to study, right? The only record I found was a case where there was a buyer who returned a slave within that one month period of refusal, but he had taken the slave to a doctor to get inspected and had had to pay the doctor like two florins or something. And so he was suing the seller for the two florins for the doctor's fee. So in that case, there was a lawsuit, but otherwise there's no need for a lawsuit. You don't have to go through the whole procedure. It's just an automatic, if you wanna return the slave, you can return the slave. So the only cases that show up are things that do not become apparent until more than a month later. Then you have to have a lawsuit in order to invalidate the sale. So that tends to be, pregnancy is one of them, um, leprosy, falling sickness, which can mean a number of things, but like anything that would count as falling sickness. And sometimes respiratory issues come up and then you have some sort of odd cases, but those, those four are the main ones. So I can't tell you in general how many people succeed at returning slaves because most of them do it under the radar and there's no written record, right? The only ones are, or, or if a slave dies, if the slave dies like two or three months after sale and they die because of some kind of a health reason, then you can have a lawsuit over that as well. Um, and then the, the debate in the context of the lawsuit is who was misleading whom. So, so this, this chapter that will eventually come out, the sort of main case study for it is a, a very extended lawsuit over a slave who has perhaps has leprosy. And there are all kinds of twists and turns. Um, the slave died of leprosy. It turns out that the slave died of leprosy, I think it was nine years after she was originally purchased and then the buyer brought the lawsuit. So the question is what was going on during those nine years? Because it, then you have the, the neighbors and his wife testify and they knew right away after the slave came into the household that she had leprosy but there's no lawsuit until after she dies. So there's somebody lying in that lawsuit and it's not entirely clear who it is. Um, but the, but these, these are the terms of the lawsuits are, are trying to prove who knew what at the time of sale. And sometimes you can bring in a physician who will say, this is clearly a condition that developed after the time of sale. So it's not relevant to this lawsuit. Or you can bring in a physician who will say, this is clearly a condition that developed before the sale. So if it wasn't disclosed, if the buyer wasn't aware, then the seller is liable. Then you have, you know, what if the buyer, what if the seller disclosed this um, verbally, but didn't write it down? What if the written warranty in the contract was different from the standard? I mean, there's sort of a standard warranty, but sometimes they phrase it differently. So if it's a different warranty, then the terms and conditions are different. Um, that's sort of the ground on which the lawsuits are being fought. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you, Bailey, and thank you, Hannah. Um, there were some folks who had their hands up but put them down, I think, to uh, prioritize uh, graduate students and others. But if um, either Jen or James would like to ask their questions, I can turn it over to them. Thank you. Yes, you read it correctly. I was like, if there's time, it's got to go to the grad students. Um, thank you. It's so interesting. And one of the questions I have is it's sort of a different direction related to history of medicine. And that is the physicians doing these inspections. And I wondered because, right, they're one of many with medical knowledge during this period. Um, how they become prioritized over, let's say, midwives, especially with female bodies. So that's mostly what my question was, is do, uh, do midwives ever get brought into the question of 
medical authority knowledge over bodies and, and the ways that these are these inspections are occurring? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the stuff that has been written about this has been previous to this has been has been focused on that. So there's there's an article by there's one by Carmel Farragut and then there's one by Deborah Blumenthal that are looking at similar lawsuits about slave health, but they're looking at um, Barcelona and Valencia. And so it's more Iberian and they're similar in certain ways, but different in other ways from Genoa. Um, but the, the short answer is yes, they are bringing in other people. So their physicians are one group that gets called in. Um, less midwives per se, but women of the family definitely get called in as experts, not just on issues about pregnancy and menstruation and things, but also about, you know, this slave has a cough. How long has she had this cough? How serious is this cough, right? So you could ask a physician, but you could ask the woman of the house. Other slaves are brought in. So if there's two slaves in the same household, they will bring both of them in to test about, testify about one of their health. Um, neighbors in this case about leprosy, the neighbors turn out to be really important. Um, sometimes they'll bring in people who are on the same ship. So if this is a question about a sail that took place in the Black Sea, and then the slave in question is brought to Italy, and then the, the question is whether, what was going on in the Black Sea, right? Was the person sick or injured or whatever at that point? Um, so sometimes it will be other slaves on the ship if there were a group of slaves being brought together. And sometimes it'll be ship scribes are brought in because they have to record everyone who's on the ship. So they presumably know which slaves are on the ship and who do they belong to. And they'll ask the ship scribe, you know, did you notice this person coughing? Did you notice this person having any kind of skin conditions? Um, it also depends, like I was saying before, the lawsuits can turn on two sets of issues. There's one set of issues that are medical issues about what exactly if anything is the slave suffering from and if so how long has this been the case and who knew about it and then the other set of questions is really legal questions about you know what are the terms of the contract was it a standard warranty was there a disclosure all that kind of thing so if they end up fixating more on the legal issues they're not even going to bother talking to physicians if they're fixating more on the medical issues, they might talk to visit physicians, they might bring in these other people who are considered to have relevant information. Um, so I wouldn't say midwives specifically, but yeah, there's definitely this, there's this much broader framework. And this leprosy case, again, in this chapter that isn't out yet, I, like it's finished, it's gone to copy editing and everything, I'm just waiting for the book to come out. Um, there's, they actually push some of the witnesses on who, who are not physicians, right? The, the, the buyer's wife, the neighbors, how do you know this is leprosy? And some of them say, well, I'm not, I'm not a physician. I don't know for sure. And the, I think it's one of the neighbors comes back and says, well, I go to the leprosarium and this, this woman's fingers looked like the fingers of the people in the leprosarium, right? Um, so there's, there's other kinds of claims to knowledge that are not necessarily sort of educated physician knowledge for sure. Okay. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, Hannah. Um, are there any other questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. If not, um, please join me in thanking, uh, Dr. Hannah Barker for this wonderful, wonderful event. Um, I think we all learned uh, a whole lot and, um, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you. This is a great discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Of course.